Hello, it's John Heaton, and today I'm going to revisit the, the topic of um, Beatles compilations and whether they're necessary or whether they're irrelevant or who, who they're aimed at, that kind of thing. I did this once before, but I'm going to go into a bit more detail this time. And also, this is a response to a vid video on the Parlogram channel where um, the guy argued that... Um, well, he went through all the Beatles compilations and ranked them basically and, and well said what he thought was the best and the worst and the flaws in each of them. So I'm going to do the same. I'm going to go in chronological order. I've got the ones in my collection and there's a bit of a mixture, mainly UK, but a few US ones in here and I think I've got a Brazilian one in here to show you as well and it's quite interesting which tracks were selected for, for which and after a bit I gave up buying compilation albums because if I'm honest I might have my favorites amongst all of them but I rarely play them if I want to listen to the Beatles I invariably go back to the albums and the only exception would be uh, the past masters volume one and two where they did a good job of sort of including all the singles and the b-sides which weren't on an album and put them on one record and for, for that reason, that's a good one to, to, to go and play. But in these days of Spotify or um, playlists, I think there's very little need for anyone for a Beatles compilation because a casual fan can go and select tracks randomly from um, the albums or whatever playlists have been created out there. And obviously the fans are going to go for the albums I, I really don't see the point in the compilations but back in the day before the days of even before the days of home taping uh, there was a point to having compilation albums and the first one to come out was this one December of 66 collection of Beatles oldies but goldies now it gets slagged off the, co the cover but it is of its period you can tell it was released in the 60s because the 60s clothes Carnaby Street and all that and the picture of the Beatles on tour in 66, I think, in the Far East. And um, this album basically included all the hit singles that, that the Beatles had had, plus one track in the UK which was not released up until now, up until this album in the UK, which was Bad Boy, the Larry Williams track, being released in the US. And this album, by the way, was not even picked up by Capitol. They didn't even bother releasing it because compilation albums were not very common in those days it, for Capital. It, uh, kind of the, or more, compilation album was more used as a vehicle at the end of a, an artist's career. They just put out a greatest hits, but uh, they didn't go for this one. It only got to number seven in the UK, probably if it released in December, probably a, released a bit late to capture the Christmas market. Should have been released a month earlier. Um, but uh, this was the first album I remember being in my parents' house growing up. And I have a sneaking feeling my brother, <laughs> I hate to admit it, but I think my brother was listening to this even before I was, so good for him. Uh, but anyway, this album is very nice in, in that it picks, it collects all the singles. Now, the Parlogram guy was saying the only point in this, buying this album was to get the Bad Boy track. But I, I disagree, because even if you had all the singles, it's very nice to have them on an album, because it's a bit of a bit of a bore to have to put on a seven inch single and then take it off and put the next one on etc so I have them on the album and I can imagine on an album is very nice and I can imagine in the Christmas of 66 going to a party with this album you must must have made you pretty popular because you can pop it on and everyone was uh, going to be dancing away to it it was the music of the time most popular band of the time and this was a great compilation um, I don't have a bad way to bad word to say about it really, um, as of when it was released. It's a bit redundant now, but uh, the, the neat thing it, it did it also included yesterday and Michelle, which were not singles in the UK, but popular choices and very very well known songs, sort of in the public, um, in the sort of well known by 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 the general public. So that was sixty six. This is my Japanese copy, which came out on the green apple. If you notice the the back cover is reversed there. This is the original for some reason. And this picture is always intrigued me because George Harrison <laughs> doesn't look particularly like George Harrison, but I'm sure it is. Anyway, that was some um, one thing we fans have talked about over the years. Now I'm not really going to talk about Mystery Tour although because it is 
viewed as a bona fide album in the Beatles collection. But at the time in the US when this album was released, this is a German copy, by the way, um, it was a compilation because it was the British EP plus a load of other songs released in the same year. And what made it successful is every song is from 1967. So it, it makes for a very good listening experience. No complaints there. Another US um, compilation came out in February 1970. Um, was the, the brainchild of Alan Klein. And uh, this album was very important to me growing up. Brilliant packaging, brilliant pictures from the final photo session, August 22nd, 69, Tittenhurst Park. And th this album was, the only thing I would say against this album is Can't Be Guy Me Love and I Should Have Known Better are slightly out of place compared to all the other songs on the album, but I'm not sure which album, which songs they could have put on. People have said they should have had The Inner Light or You Know My Name, but You Know My Name hadn't even been released when this album was being put together. So, and I'm not sure if The Inner Light and You, My Na no, you Know My Name are good enough to be on a compilation alongside all the songs, the other songs on, on here, such as Hey Jude, Paperback Writer, Revolution, Lady Madonna, <laughs> Ballad of John and Yoko, Don't Let Me Down, Old Brown Shoe, Rain. It really is a brilliant compilation, or it was at the time. It's a bit redundant now. Now, this is a bootleg collection of all the Beatles Christmas records, which were records where the Beatles put together a few Christmas jingles and a few bits of poetry and sent it out to the fan club members. And this is actually a bootleg, you can tell. <laughs> Even before coloured vinyl became a craze, the bootleggers were catching on that fans loved coloured vinyl and they were doing a fake apple sleeve and this horrible green murky vinyl. I don't play this album but it wasn't too expensive, 10 or 12 pounds I seem to remember. So I picked it up, I think it was in Camden. And this is the Brazilian one I was talking about, The Beatles Forever, I've showed it on a previous video but this came out in 1972. and. It, it's interesting partly because it's on the Apple label, the Brazilian Apple label, which is quite always interesting to see in an alternative Apple, but also because of the track listing and it's a little bit random. Um, if I read you the track listing, Day Tripper, yes it is, I'm down. Okay, those, those are from the same year. Then The Fool on the Hill, Strawberry Fields, We Can Work It Out. Your Mother Should Know kicks off side two, followed by Penny Lane, Baby You're a Rich Man, I Call Your Name. The Inner Light and Blue Jay Way. So, if not quite totally random, pretty random collection there from Brazil. Um, then in 73, the, the first effort to come up with a genuine retrospective. It had been three years since the Beatles split. Alan Klein said it's time for a, a proper compilation triggered by this bootleg which was coming out, Alpha and Omega, and selling well. And so they thought we better put out our own version. So they came up with the red and the blue um, brilliant packaging and a pretty decent effort to select the tracks. I know one criticism is there were six tracks from Rubber Soul and only two from Revolver or five tracks from Rubber Soul. But you know, um, I don't have any complaints because I think the tracks they did pick from Rubber Soul, Drive My Car, Norwegian Wood, In My Life, No One Man, um, Girl, I, I, I can't argue with those choices at all. I mean, I'm, I saw her standing there in Tax Manor, other notable admissions, but uh, that, that, that's from the Red Album. The Blue Album, I, I well, I don't listen to either, to be honest. I can't listen to compilations from the Beatles after 66. I think that the songs are too incongruous. The mood is too different between the albums. Um, you know, the flow of the songs. The, the Beatles spend an awful lot of time on the track listing of their albums. Uh, particularly after after the touring years had ended. And to take a track like Sgt. Pepper and take it out of context and put it on the Blue Album, to me it just, um, I can't listen to it on the Blue Album and I have a soft spot for the Blue Album primarily because of the packaging and because of the blue vinyl I have it on as well. But uh, I, I don't actually listen to it. And I guess these days no one, no one does other than for sentimental reasons perhaps. Um, then, the Beatles EMI contract expired in 75 and uh, most of the Beatles signed with another label, Ringo did, George did, and John decided not to sign with anyone. Um, 
and the, so EMI thought, what can we do? We've still got this back catalogue, we, we still have the rights to put it out. So they came up with the, the concept of rock and roll music, which was a double compilation album, but with a theme to it. So they, want, they put all the upbeat songs from the Beatles on this album, called Rock and Roll Music. And then they, the following year, they put all the love songs, another double album, on this album. And um, relatively successful, particularly rock and roll music. Um, I did have the chart position somewhere, but I think it got pretty high. Number two in the US, I seem to remember. Uh, love Songs not quite success so successful, but Love Songs has the beautiful um, picture. I did write down who who wrote the who d took the picture, but I seem to have. Uh, Seem to have left it in the other room, but it's it's a great it's a great picture uh, from 1967, and I think that there's although I didn't listen to them myself, I can imagine at the time rock and roll music might it might have been a neat neat one to take to a party. Again, these were in the days before Spotify, before even before home taping, cassettes weren't weren't even a thing really in '76, or well, hardly. I don't remember them coming out until the late '70s. Um, and certainly home taping didn't kick off until then. So, so to have these albums sort of to take to a party, if you want to be in a mellow mood, you take love songs. If it's an upbeat dancing party, you take rock and roll music. Nothing wrong with it. Rarities came out in 79. And this was originally a bonus disc in a kind of box set of all the Beatles albums. And then they decided to release it separately the following year. Um, so it came out in 78 in the box set and then 79 separately. Now it, can, it does do a neat job of collecting up a lot of songs which were B-sides or not on an album. Not Some of them not particularly rare, but um, it's, it was nice to have. It's just terrible packaging. I mean, look at that cover. Can you, I mean, look how dark it is and uh, sort of uninspired. And this would be a feature of most compilation albums, the red and the blue apart. And I quite like I quite like this Love Songs cover, actually. Um, the rock and roll music cover is terrible. John Lennon had offered to do the packaging for it and was turned down by Capitol. So that this cover was designed by the same guy who d designed that famous Walls and Bridges album for John. And I think he did Shave Fish as well. Um, but uh, yeah, it's Ro Roy Kohara did Shave Fish and, and Walls and Bridges, but... Uh, this was not one of his best. And also, I didn't show you the gatefold. This rock and roll music, sort of 50s stuff, uh, really nothing to do with the 60s, uh, more to do with what American rock and roll was going through in the 60s. They've even got sort of Coca-Cola bottles and stuff. Um, anyway, fairly minor criticism, because I don't mind that album or I don't play it. Now, this is the US version of Rarities, which actually did a better job in coming up with some genuine rarities, such as Penny Lane with the, uh, the trumpet solo at the end, which was not on the single. Um, and, and I love her with the extended um, guitar bit at the end. Um, so that was interesting. Now, now, that, now we get into pointless retreads, and this is where I stopped buying compilations, although I did pick this up recently. The Beatles Ballads from 1980, just complete copy of love songs, really, although it was, they put on one album. And the, John Patrick Byrne did the cover, and apparently this was going to be considered for the one of the possible ideas for the White Album cover, um, apparently. And it's a great picture, but that's about the only good thing I can say about the album, um, although it's nice to have for the cover. Now, in 1982, they came out with an album called Beatles' 20 Greatest Hits. Didn't sell very well, quickly got deleted. And then, ever since then, they've been recycling stuff. This was the Beatles, what's it called? The Beatles movie, movie music or something. Uh, just takes tracks which appeared in the Beatles films and just puts them on an album, pretty pointless, really. Um, and then, as I say, this, this album came out in 1987. Didn't bother picking it up on vinyl. This is the double CD of Past Masters Volume 1 and 2 on one CD, although originally in 2009 came out in two, sorry, in 87 it came out in two CDs. Um, and this is this is great because it picks up all the B-sides, like Yes It Is, The Inner Light, Revolution, 
um, she's a woman, you know, all these great, I'll get you, thank you girl, they're all on here, plus all the singles which weren't on an album, like For Me To You, I Feel Fine, uh, Please Please Me, uh, everything. So uh, this is a worthy album, the only thing I would say is that the cover is terrible, again, this is uh, courtesy of Mark Lewis and I think he designed this cover, can't really think, can't. I mean, I guess they wanted to be sort of straightforward and not elaborate. Well, they certainly achieved that. But I think they could have done a lot better than that. Anyway, so I didn't bother buying subsequent compilations. Like the one album did sell a lot of copies you know, in when it came out, um, whenever it was, 10 or 12 years ago. The, I did pick up the this version, which has, is the DVD version of the one album which is thoroughly worthy, and we, us fans had been asking for this for years and years and years. So when that came out, <coughs> that was a must-buy, but the actual one album itself, completely redundant for Beatles fans. And people are talking about, shall we have a new Beatles compilation for the new generation? Well, what's the point? I, I really don't see the point. I would rather direct new fans directly to the albums, R Rubber Soul, Revolver, Sgt. Pepper, Abbey Road, or whatever wherever you want to start really. You can start off with Hard Day's Night if you like. Um, but it's interesting to see which way compilation albums have gone. So it was a fairly genuine attempt to, to come up with sort of thematic albums back in the day and then gradually it became more of a kind of lucrative market for ripping off the fans and being a bit cynical here. The anthology um, was more all 100% outtakes or alternative versions and whilst it was very good for the die-hard fan, I, fa I felt uneasy going into a shop and seeing it in the racks alongside all the other Beatles albums. So I dread to think, uh, if I was going to recommend someone to get into the Beatles, I would not start them off on an anthology, especially Anthology 1. Um, not a good way to start, but uh, anyway, nowadays nobody buys the CD anyway and it's available on Spotify as, as it should be. Um, been various other albums like Love, the 2006 thing, a lot of people say they like that. I played it a few times, loved it for a th two or three months and then went back to the original albums. Um, by the way, that was the same with Let It Be Naked as well. Um, so nowadays, th the, way it, th the way they want to sell the Beatles music to the fans is they've concentrated on the, the sort of the core fan base and selling these expensive box sets, um, which cost a fortune. And the casual fans, I think they've given up on the casual fans because they figure they're just going to go to Spotify and pick, pick and choose. And they're probably right. So I don't think we need another Beatles compilation. If I had to pick my favourite out of all the ones I've shown you, um, for packaging and for completion's sake, it would be the Red and the Blue. And just for sentimental value, it would be the Hey Jude album uh, from 1970, which I picked up when it came out in the UK in 79. Um, from a purely practical, functional point of view, Past Masters probably takes the, probably uh, probably wins. Um, so that was my take on Beatles compilations. It was a bit negative. Sorry about that, but uh, I don't think there's a huge place in the world for a Beatles compilation because often the flow of an album is so important. The sequencing, the mood, the era. If you if you take songs from different eras. And within the space of six years, the Beatles went through at least three or four different eras, or not eras, but you know what I mean, kind of the psychedelic period, the late period, the mid period, uh, the early early period, the, the marijuana period, etc. And if you take them out of context, they, they can appear to be pretty incongruous some of the time, listen to one after the other, these tracks. So as I say, I prefer to go back to the original albums, but then again, I would say that, wouldn't I? So thank you for watching. See you next time.